my understanding is, is that you went out with this protector of yours who swore that you were uh, his adopted godson. Yes, yes. Went out, in fact, and helped in the confiscation of property yes. from the Jews. That's right. Yes. I mean, that's, that sounds uh, like an experience that would send lots of people to the psychiatric couch for many, many years. Was it difficult? Uh, uh, not, not, not at all. Not at all. It of all the financial titans and philanthropists of the 20th century, none are more complex or mysterious than George Soros. Like Carnegie, J.P. Morgan, and the Rockefellers, he amassed billions through ruthless business decisions, only to turn around and give away most of his fortune to advance his own personal philosophy. He can move world financial markets simply by voicing an opinion, or destabilize a government by buying and selling its currency. He also pledged more aid last year to help people in Russia than the U.S. government did. But now George Soros is worried. He thinks the global economy is coming apart at the seams and that the world needs to be protected from people like George Soros. We may now think that everything is fine, but the fact is that the system is broke and it needs fixing. What you're doing is, is, is asking uh, some form of regulation to protect the world against you. Well... I am a player, and I think all players should be regulated. There have to be rules of the game. Take 81,000 to buy. Buy 48,000. Buy him 69,000 YUM. Right now, his quantum group hedge fund moves $14 billion of rich investors' money around the world every day, looking for profits and answering to no one. Soros makes huge bets on whole countries and economies. Last year, when he saw cracks in the Asia boom, he began selling the currency in Thailand. Traders in Hong Kong followed suit, triggering a financial crisis that plunged much of Asia into a depression. In the last two years, you've been blamed for financial collapse of Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, Japan, and Russia. All of the, all of the above. Well, all of the above. Yeah, yeah. Are you that powerful? No, I think there's a great misunderstanding. The Prime Minister of, of Malaysia yes. um, said that the region spent 40 years trying to build up its economy, and along comes a moron like Soros right. with a lot of money, and it's all over. He called you a criminal. It's easier for him to blame an outside force <clears throat> than to admit that they were mismanaging uh, their economy and their currency. The uh, French finance minister uh, talked about hanging uh, speculators from lampposts. Soros says the Asian currencies would have collapsed even if he hadn't been in the market. They were overvalued. He says people tend to follow his lead because he's been so successful. I think that uh, I've been blamed, blamed for everything. I am basically there to, uh, to make money. I cannot and do not look at the social consequences of, of what I do. This man is uh, a carnivore of the first order. Jim Grant is the editor of Grant's Interest Rate Observer and one of Wall Street's most respected analysts. He never tires of watching Soros, in part because of the huge bets he's willing to place on his hunches. He has um, always amazed the people he's worked with at his audacity and his willingness to back up his commitments with enormous sums of money. It causes the blood to drain from ordinary mortals' faces. Like risking $2 billion in Russia. When the Russian market began falling apart in August, Soros was the country's single largest investor. He called the U.S. Treasury and asked Uncle Sam for $7 billion to prop up the ruble. When U.S. officials failed to intervene, Soros wrote a letter to the Financial Times of London saying he thought the Russian currency should be devalued by as much as 25 percent. A few words from Soros were enough to cause panic selling that fueled the crash. What's it like to have a statement that you make have such serious, grievous consequences? I mean, you can, it, it looks to me like in a number of situations, you can take a position against a currency or make a statement, and the whole country falls apart. Well, it's a tremendous sense of responsibility, actually. Uh, and, it, and it's also a humbling experience because I am actually trying to uh, do the right thing, and sometimes what I do uh, has an unintended negative consequence, as it did in, in Russia. For both the Russian middle class and for Soros, who lost his $2 billion. 
Whatever his motivations, no one can accuse him of greed. He's backed away from the day-to-day -day operation of his businesses and is giving away his billions now with the same determination that he made them in places like Haiti, a country that has less money in the bank than he does. Last month, he brought the First Lady with him for a look at some of the projects his foundation is funding. This is Mr. George Soros, and uh, he's going to be helping the hospital. This year, Soros plans to give away almost $500 million around the world. In Bosnia, when the water supply to Sarajevo was cut off at the height of the siege, it was Soros who wrote a check to jury-rig a pipeline through an abandoned highway tunnel. $5 million up front can be more valuable than $50 million a year or two later. Ambassador Richard Holbrook brokered the peace in Bosnia. At one point, after the Dayton peace agreements in Bosnia in 1995, for, for a considerable period of time, George had given more money to implement the peace agreements than the U.S. government had. He just could move that fast. In Russia, he pledged $100 million to help scientists who might otherwise have sold their expertise to bidders like Iran or Iraq. In Eastern Europe, he's educated a new generation. And in Ukraine, he spent millions retraining the old Soviet military. At the center of George Soros, there's an inherent contradiction. Which is? Which is, on one hand, uh, you're, the, you're the capitalist who does not care about the social consequences of his act. And on the other hand, you are a philanthropist who cares only about social consequences. How do you resolve the two? Recognizing that, that uh, as, as a competitor, I've got to compete to win. As a human being, I, can, I, I am concerned about the society in which I live. Which George Soros am I talking to now, the amoral George Soros or the, the moral George Soros? Uh, it's one person. It's one person who at one time engages in amoral activities and at the rest of the time tries to be moral. To understand the complexities and contradictions in his personality, you have to go back to the very beginning, to Budapest, where George Soros was born 68 years ago to parents who were wealthy, well-educated, and Jewish. When the Nazis occupied Budapest in 1944, George Soros' father was a successful lawyer. He lived on an island in the Danube and liked to commute to work in a rowboat. But knowing there were problems ahead for the Jews, he decided to split his family up. He bought them forged papers, and he bribed a government official to take 14-year-old George Soros in and swear that he was his Christian godson. But survival carried a heavy price tag. While hundreds of thousands of Hungarian Jews were being shipped off to the death camps, George Soros accompanied his phony godfather on his appointed rounds, confiscating property from the Jews. These are pictures from 1944 of what happened to George Soros' friends and neighbors. You're a Hungarian Jew mm -hmm. who escaped the Holocaust mm -hmm. by posing as a, a Christian. Right. And... You watched lots of people get shipped off to the death camps. Right. I was 14 years old. And I would say that that's when my character was made. In what way? That one should think ahead, one should understand and, and anticipate events. Uh, and uh, one, one is threatened. It was a tremendous threat of evil. I mean, it was a, a very personal experience of evil. My understanding is, is that you went out with this protector of yours who swore that you were uh, his adopted godson. Yes, Christian. yes. Went out, in fact, and helped in the confiscation of property yes. from the Jews. That's right. Yes. I mean, that's, that sounds uh, like an experience that would send lots of people to the psychiatric couch for many, many years. Was it difficult? Uh, uh, not, not, not at all. Not at all. It, uh, maybe as a child, you don't you don't see the connection, uh, uh, but it was it created no no problem at all. No feeling of guilt. No. For example, that uh, I'm Jewish, uh, mm. and here I am watching these people go. I could just as easily be there. I should be there. None of that. Well, uh, of course, I, uh, I could be on the other side, or I could be the one from whom it, the thing is being taken away. Uh, um, but 
there was no sense that I shouldn't be there because uh, that was uh, uh, well actually funny way it's just like in markets that if I weren't there of course I wasn't doing it but somebody else would, 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 would be taking it away anyhow. In other words, the, whether I was there or not, I was only a spectator, the property was being taken away. So the, I had no role in taking away that property. So I had no sense of guilt. Are you religious? No. Do you believe in God? No. Soros told us he believes God was created by man, not the other way around which may be why he thinks he can smooth out the world's imperfections. When we went with him to Ukraine, he was treated like a visiting head of state and was received by the president. Then he was received by the prime minister and finally the central bank. 20% in cash. They even allowed him to look at the books and asked him for advice. Lots of people want George Soros' advice. Most recently, South African President Nelson Mandela. Actually, President Mandela... Uh, asked me uh, how could South Africa protect itself against speculators like you? And I told him, I wrote him a memo t trying to give him the best advice I could uh, how to uh, uh, reduce the, the, the uh, exposure of South Africa to, sp to speculative attack. That's the old stop me before, before I kill again approach, right? Well, You're telling this is what you can do to stop me. Whether I or somebody else uh, does whatever is happening in the markets really doesn't make any difference to the outcome. I don't feel guilty because I'm engaged in an amoral activity which is not meant to have anything to do with guilt. Part of the reason he is so rich is that the Soros hedge funds operate offshore in the Netherlands Antilles to avoid scrutiny by the Securities and Exchange Commission. So even while Soros tells Congress and the Treasury that hedge funds must be regulated to stop the global crisis, he's avoiding the rules. Why is it that, uh, that Americans can't invest in the quantum fund? It's an offshore fund. Why is that? Because the fund is not registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, so so uh, uh, we, we are not licensed to do business in the United States. That's right. Because? Be, because we are not registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission. We, 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 because we, we find it more convenient to operate without it. So in some ways it's to escape regulation. Yeah, that's right. But you've been sitting here talking about uh, the need for regulation. Yes, and whatever regulations are imposed, we will obey. We will, we will, we, we already confirm to every, uh, conform to everything. If the beneficiaries of Soros's billions do not understand the intricacies of SEC rules and offshore hedge funds, they do understand what he's done for them. The president of Haiti is reading his new book, The Crisis of Global Capitalism, and so is President Clinton. Will all the attention spoil George Soros? George Soros, in a way, is, uh, is Donald Trump without the humility. <laughs> One of your money manager told us uh, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, George really does think he's a god. <laughs> I mean, if you think that you're god and you go into financial markets, you're bound to come out broke. So the fact that I'm not broke shows that I don't believe that I'm god. Welcome to the Glenn Beck Program. America, tonight I ask you to watch this program with an open mind. I ask you to put your partisan differences aside and really listen, and then do your own homework. Don't take my word for it. Research yourself. This is far too important. The topic tonight and tomorrow night, George Soros. There are things that are happening in this country that don't make sense. Van Jones said something that bothered me over the summer. I mean, he said a lot of things over the years that have bothered me, but one comment in particular over the summer stuck with me, and it was this. You handle the top down, but it's also bottom up and inside out. Top down, bottom up, and inside out. So now your challenge as you leave here, our challenge, is to take care of that bottom up part and that inside out part, the heart part. That's not, that's bothered me because I know who this guy is. He's a 
communist revolutionary, a guy who, who pined for the days of Stalin. The Iron Curtain went down. Something's wrong there. Well, it really bothered me until recently when I started looking into all the George Soros connections and the size and the scope of his reach. And let me tell you something. I, I said to you, read up on George Soros. There's plenty of ways to read about him. These are all books about George Soros, many of them written by him. So there's no shortage of information. And read them. Read them. The comment doesn't bother, any me, doesn't bother me anymore. I understand what it means. And that's why that comment now frightens me. And I will put it into perspective tonight and tomorrow. Pull back the curtain and reveal what that actually means. And it will terrify you. There's a couple of other things that you'll understand. First of all, in 2003, Soros and a partner funded the new $5 million liberal group, MoveOn.org. Well, MoveOn.org, what, what exactly is that? Well, you remember it. This is the group that uh, originally called General Petraeus, General Betrayus. It was despicable. Well, who had they tapped for the executive director of MoveOn.org? This guy, Zach Exley. I've never heard of him before. Do you know who he is? Well, he previously had trained activists for the anarchist group, the Ruckus Society. These are the riots in Seattle. Helped orchestrate by this guy. More on that in just a minute. Oh, by the way, he's also a blogger for the Huffington Post, which is interesting because the Huffington Post gets money from George Soros. Oh, and he's also a fellow with the George Soros Open Society Institute. Violent radicals. Oh, and by the way, it's just not that phrase that came. George Soros has been following him as he originally funded the Ella Baker Society or uh, the Center for Human Rights. And then, of course, he was on the Apollo Alliance. And then when he got fired from the White House, he went to Center for American Progress, which is also funded by George Soros. Radicals. Radicals. Oh, the Open Society Institute, in case you don't know what this is, don't worry, you will in the next couple of days. The Open Society Institute is George Soros's most important group. It is really spectacular. It is his philanthropist arm. This is where he really, he looks for Mother Teresa to give out his precious money. And boy, did he find Mother Teresa. Well, not exactly. He found, to head this organization, the founder of the violent activist group SDS. Students for a Democratic Society. You don't know what they did in the 60s? You will. One string, $425 million every single year. The strings that are being pulled by the puppet master. Hello, America. There are a few working parts to a... Uh, a puppet show. There is the uh, the puppet master here. There's the stage. There's the audience. There are the strings to each puppet. And then there's the story. But there's also why. Why is the story? Why is the show happening? What is the puppet master? What is his motivation? Is it for the money? Is it for entertainment? Is it personal gain? What is it? Make no mistake, we are watching a show. The stage is the world. It's television, it's newspaper, it's speeches, it's the political elections, it's what's happening in Washington. You are the audience. And like any good show, they do have one goal in mind. They want you to feel something. But most shows don't have a, a hidden meaning behind it. They just want you to laugh. They want you to be entertained. This one, not so much. At the end of the show, you have a choice to make. They want you to get up from your seats. Of course, they have in mind what they are planning on you choosing, and they are just using this stage to try to make the case and convince you of it. It's really propaganda. Um, here's the propaganda book. Here it is. This is actually from uh, one of um, Wilson's nasty, nasty guys. This, this is the book that I've told you before on propaganda that Hitler used. Um, Goebbels. I just want to show you in propaganda, this is D. Now this is what's taught in schools. D. Democracy is administered by the intelligent minority who know how to regiment and guide the masses. That's great. This is Edward Bernays. Let me give you the whole quote here. 
He says, the conscience and intelligent manipulation of organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in a dem democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, an invisible government, maybe almost a shadow government, remember that, which is the true ruling power of our country. Do we have a shadow government? Answer it now, remember how you answer it, and then answer it again after today's show and tomorrow's show. The question is, do we have a shadow government? And if we do, who are those intelligent minority that is, that is guiding us through? And who, where are they guiding us to? If you skip past all of the puppets and the strings, if you stop looking at the puppets themselves, you have to see who's behind the puppets. Who is choosing the puppets and the players? Who's the puppet master? George Soros. Now, I am sure that this will be called a conspiracy theory, and quite honestly, a year ago, two years ago, I wouldn't have believed it myself. But it is right out in the open. I encourage you, do not take my word for this. Do your own research, and don't go to conspiracy websites or anything else. Go to his own books. Go to the biographies written about him. Go to things that are well documented, uh, like 60 Minutes. Um, things that are well known for their accuracy. We have all of the materials that put this show together at glennbeck.com and in my free email newsletter. I want you to see the footnotes on this program. Do not take anything I say as gospel tonight. I want you to decide for yourself. I want you to question with boldness. Is George Soros a man who says, yes, you will be perfect and you will be perfect? Is he really a puppet master? And if he is, how does he control? How does he control? Well, let's start with this. Let's just take a couple of examples here on what George Soros has said and then see if there's any connection to anything. Soros spoke at Columbia University. He talked about an urgent need for campaign finance reform. I want you to remember, questioning our elections is important to George Soros. You'll understand in about 20 minutes. Well, he wanted to have uh, campaign finance reform. He thought it was important. He spoke at Columbia University about it. Well, Open Society, his, his little group, Open Society, started by the guy with SDS, it was one of only a handful of groups who spent $123 million to push finance reform. Soros, quote, said, do something about the distortion of our electoral pro pro uh, process by the excessive use of TV advertising. So he wanted to make sure that lies couldn't distort things. Well, it wasn't long after that speech at Columbia University that, lo and behold, Senator Russ Feingold, a progressive, and a few months later, uh, with um, uh, John McCain, a Republican progressive, had came with a proposal in hand for what would eventually become the McCain-Feingold Act. The irony, if it is, is that McCain-Feingold ultimately led to the explosion of 501c3 groups, which can advertise at will. 501c3 groups. Hmm. Oh, 501c3 groups? You mean like... Sojourners, or Color for Change, or the Tides Foundation, or Media Matters, or People for the American Way, or MoveOn.org, Center for American Progress, the, Alio, uh, the Apollo Alliance, Eller Saker for Human Rights. You mean those things? You see, we had the McCain-Feingold Act, and then mysteriously, almost unbeknownst to everyone, those groups became very powerful, much more powerful. And guess who controls most of the most powerful? George Soros. George Soros, in the aftermath of 9-11, talked about police action as an alternative to war. Now, did anybody pick up on that? This is what he said. War is a false and misleading metaphor in the context of combating terrorism. Crimes require police work, not military action. George Soros. Here he is, the Democratic candidate for president, Adopting crimes require police work, not military action positions. What we've learned is that the war on terror is much more of an intelligence operation and a law enforcement operation. The war on terror is far less of a military operation. 
and far more of an intelligence gathering law enforcement operation. And that's what we have now in our office starts with George Soros. Days after President Obama was elected, George Soros again set the agenda. He said, quote, I think we need a large stimulus package which will provide funds for state and local government to maintain their budgets because they are not allowed by the Constitution to run a deficit. For such a program to be successful, the federal government would need to provide hundreds of billions of dollars. In addition, another infrastructure program is necessary. In total, the cost would be between 300 and 600 billion dollar range. Well, what was on Obama's, the first thing on his agenda? The $787 billion stimulus bill. Gee, I remember this. And I remember saying at the time, who wrote this? It was too complex. It was too early in his, oh yeah, that's right, the Apollo Alliance. Where does the Apollo Alliance come from? The Tides Foundation. And where does the Tides Foundation get a lot of their funding? George Soros. Soros also heavily promotes green jobs and cap and trade. Also, days after Obama was elected, he called for a new energy bill. I think this is a great opportunity to financially deal with global warming and energy independence. The U.S. needs a cap and trade system with the auctioning of license for emissions rights. I would use the revenues from these auctions to launch a new environmentally friendly energy policy that would be yet another federal program that could help us overcome the current stagnation. Well, Congress introduced, but you stood up. You said, I don't think so. Mm -mm. The audience started to revolt. Cap and trade failed. Now, through Freedom of Information Act, we find out that the Department of Energy and the EPA actually coordinated their response to damning reports on green jobs from Spain with the help of George Soros and his Center for American Progress, which gets their funding from here, George Soros. Here it is, December 9th, 2004. Um, also, there was um, uh, this piece of information. Um, this guy, where is uh, Eli? Eli, um, a Pariser, there he is. He headed the Soros group, the front group, MoveOn.Pack. Now, he wasn't upset that Kerry lost. Why? He explained this in an email. This is important that you understand. Quote, in the last year, grassroots contributors, like us, gave more than $300 million to the Kerry campaign and the DNC and proved that the party doesn't need corporate cash to be competitive. It's now our party. We bought it, we own it, and we're going to take it back. Do you understand what just happened? George Soros got rid of all of the corporate money through McCain-Feingold which then allowed all the 501c3s to come in this one might help and this one might help and this one might help and all the 